Coming up on Omnivore, nutrition priorities through the ages, a prescription for food as medicine, and food products targeting women's health. All that and more, it's episode 8 of Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT First, annual event and expo. Join science of food professionals from around the globe, July 16th through the 19th in Chicago. Go to iftevent.org to learn more. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Baseball legend Mickey Mantle once said, If I had known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. Today's consumer is more health conscious and aware that good nutrition can tame certain health conditions, especially those that come with age. And while some nutritional ingredients are important for all ages, each generational group might seek them out differently. Food Technologies Science and Technology Editor Julie Larson Brisher recently spoke with contributing editor Linda Milo Orr about how variable those reasons are, from boomers to zoomers, as well as where they intersect. Well, hi, Linda. I'm really glad we could catch up today on your latest nutraceuticals article for Food Technology. Um, As you know, I myself am at an age where the term healthy aging really resonates. And I thought your recent article was really jam-packed with great information Mm -hmm. um, that I can apply in my own life. And I hope that our IFT members can as well. So why don't we start with the baby boomers and the Gen Xers? You know, what kinds of nutrition concerns do these older generations have? And what kinds of nutrition solutions are available to help us age in a healthy way? Yeah, so thanks, Julie, for having me. Um, So for Gen Xers and baby boomers, two of the bigger concerns right now focus on mobility and cognition. So for mobility, this age demographic we want to stay active as much as we can. Um, So focusing on our muscle health, bone, and joint health are some key areas for mobility. Regarding muscle health, what's interesting is that cardio activity has always been important, but for baby boomers and Gen Xers, there is more of an emphasis now on weight training as we get older. As we age, our muscle mass decreases, so we need to focus on building and maintaining the muscle mass that we have in order to stay active. So nutrition-wise, that means focusing on our lean protein consumption from sources like fish, poultry, and even plant protein sources coming from beans and nuts is important too. Bone health, we know calcium and vitamin D are you know essential for bone um, strength. Even vitamin K2 for bone mineral density is important. And then we look at joint health. As we get older, we can feel it getting out of the bed. Things are a little creaky or tight when we wake up in the morning. Um, So joint health is essential for staying active. As we get older, just like our muscle mass, the collagen in our body decreases. So collagen peptides have become popular with baby boomers and Gen Xers to help protect our ligaments and our tendons. An added plus for collagen peptides is the reported benefits for our skin health, so elasticity and wrinkles, Um, and then our hair and nail strength as well. The other area of focus was cognition that I mentioned for boomers and Gen Xers. And this just doesn't include our memory, but it also includes preserving our mental sharpness, our focus, and our alertness. Omega-3 fatty acids, fatty fish like salmon, and fish oils, you know, those have all been promoted for cognition. Omega-3s are prevalent in our brain, so they've been shown to be neuroprotective and hence why, you know, good for our cognition. Um, Another area is antioxidants. Antioxidants are looked to to help fight neuroinflammation and then also just help prevent some of the oxidative stress in our brain. Right. I think I have noticed that just by looking more toward increasing those kinds of nutrients in my diet, 
really does help me with my brain scrambles, you know, or my Sudoku's or whatever, you know, like I feel like I'm getting better scores. (laughs) (laughs) That's true though. I mean, it's, it it is all tied, you know, staying active is tied to your nutrition. And if you're not eating well, you're not going to be as active. You, you know, you can injure yourself easier. Plus you're also paying more attention to your diet in general. So, you know, even with cholesterol, you know, if you're watching what you're eating because you're trying to stay more active, your overall diet is improving. What about the millennials? Like, do they have different nutritional concerns um, or or ones that are more important to them, you Mm -hmm. know, as compared with other generations? Yeah. So millennials, what's interesting is their generation, what stands out is their concerns with mental health. So the Mental Health Foundation estimates that about 40% of the millennials are affected with, you know, some type of mental health condition. And with millennials, a lot of them are dealing with anxiety and stress. And every generation has that. But the interesting thing about the millennial generation is that they're the ones who brought mental health to the forefront in society. You know, older generations have tended to kind of not talk about your mental health or, you know, it's behind closed doors or whatever. So this generation has brought awareness and even acceptance around mental health and treating conditions like stress and anxiety. So with mental health, botanicals, you know, are one set of ingredients that hit, that are popular among this age group, um, especially botanicals for stress and anxiety. They're, they're clean label, they're plant-based, And so any botanicals that have some type of calming effect, you know, is popular. So ashwagandha, chamomile, and lavender. Side note, what's also kind of interesting is generations, well, millennials and a little bit of Generation Z were seeing a rise in their consumption of mocktails, which, um, you know, little to no alcoholic beverages. And part of that is due to mental health. And maybe even physical health as well. But it is there is a rise in this demographic of them consuming it. So that opens the door for food formulators to create some fun mocktails with botanicals in them. Some of these calming botanicals. Yeah, a fun little area for them to look into. Right. Well, now in your article, you also mentioned that Generation Z or the Zoomers appear to be more aware of social justice and saving the environment type issues. Does that impact their approach to healthy aging and nutrition? Yeah. So Generation Z or Zoomers, like you said, it's not just healthy aging anymore for just their physical selves. It's also healthy aging for the planet. And so for this age demographic, you know, transparency, sustainability, Foods and beverages that are created ethically and socially responsibly is important to this age demographic as well. So they are, you know, they're still focused on nutrition, but also focused on, is this good for the planet? They want to know the stories behind their foods and beverages and how they were created, where they came from. They want to know and be ensured that what they're eating is also healthy for the planet. So this age demographic, we're seeing more flexitarian type diets. Um, and a little bit more focus on plant-based consumption or even alternative proteins. What's exciting or could be exciting is that Gen Z, they've grown up with technology. You know, they're, they're familiar, they're comfortable with it. So they could be the ones that are more open to science and some of these scientific advancements we're seeing in food production, as long as they know as it's good for the planet. <laughs> so if they can understand some of these practices like cellular agriculture or precision fermentation, if they can understand it, know that it kind of results in less land and animal farming, they could be the ones who are willing to try these ingredients and foods created with these methods and be willing to accept it as well, as long as they understand it. So kind of helping them understand the science behind these. Right. And then finally, there's Generation Alpha. What a what a great name <laughs> for a generation. I'm kind of jealous. Um, but these are the youngest of us born between 2010 and will be born through 2025. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, most of the people in this demographic aren't making their own nutrition choices. Um, but 
what choices are adults making for them and why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Generation Alpha, they are predominantly children of the millennials. And so since they're still growing at these ages, their parents are focused on healthy development of their bodies and their brains. So from infants through toddlers, you know, and even preteens, initially in nutrients like omega-3 fatty acids, you find that in infant formula, baby foods, toddler foods, that's important for their brain development and even their eye development as well. Bone health is important because as kids get older, they're involved in sports, they're involved in other activities, and they have a lot more energy than some of us Gen Xers and baby boomers. So their bone health is important, calcium, vitamin D, um, again, vitamin K2, um, and then protein. You know, I mean, protein across the board, across all ages is important for their muscle development. So getting the lean protein consumption for, for this age as well. Um, but yeah, so that's the interesting thing is some of these ingredients, they span all these age demographics, but for different reasons. Right. Well, thanks, Linda. It's really been great talking with you today. And I think I'm off to cook up some Pacific Northwest salmon for dinner <laughs> and get my omega-3 fatty acid intake up today. That sounds good. And maybe sprinkle a little collagen on top of that too. Nice. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you again. Thanks, Thanks Linda. Julie. Linda Milo Orr is a food scientist and writer based in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, and a contributing editor for Food Technology. Read more about generational nutrition trends in the March issue. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. At IFT First annual event and expo this July, attendees will experience innovation in action, research, scientific discoveries, and connect with peers new and old. The theme of this year's IFT First is innovation in a time of crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Attendee registration is now open. Register today at iftevent.org. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Roughly four and a half trillion dollars, more than 18% of GDP in the United States, is spent on health care, much of it treating ailments like diabetes, heart disease, and other problems tied to poor nutrition. Physician and Harvard professor David Eisenberg says many medical professionals are ill-equipped to prevent these problems, partly because they lack proper nutritional training but also because they don't have a deep understanding of food to present appealing food options that their patients will accept and embrace. His Teaching Kitchen Collaborative aims to connect hospitals, medical schools, and universities with hands-on culinary training to develop recipe-driven curricula that they can share with the general public. I recently spoke with Dr. Eisenberg about his work, the philosophy and policy of food as medicine, and the role that food manufacturers can play as partners. Well, Dr. Eisenberg, thanks for coming on the podcast and for your terrific interview in the March issue of Food Tech. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Bill. Your life's work has been studying the role of food in preventive medicine. Uh, in the article, though, you share that this was rooted in some personal tragedy. Can you just briefly explain a little bit of the backstory? What got you here? Sure. So on paper, if you see my CV, I'm a Harvard, Harvard, Harvard trained guy, what we call preparation age, medical school, college, resident fellowship, training, faculty. I'm actually the son of a baker from Brooklyn who learned to bake bread from his father who came from Eastern Europe. And I grew up at my father's side in a bakery. And I fell in love with cooking and baking before I could read, before I could ride a bicycle. When I was 10 and my father was 39, he died suddenly of a heart attack. My two grandmothers had died six and seven weeks earlier and my one remaining grandparent died months later, all of unrelated acute illnesses. And as was the custom in the 60s, uh, my mother never discussed this. 
thinking she would spare her four children of some of the agony of the loss. You can imagine that as a preteen, not knowing what had happened, many thoughts would go through my mind, one of which was, I need to go to medical school to understand what had happened. Chapter two, I finish high school as Nixon is opening up China. Henry Kissinger is sent to reopen the dialogue. The New York Times sends a reporter to track Henry Kissinger. That reporter gets appendicitis, is operated on, and three days after his operation, he has abdominal pain, which is obliterated by acupuncture needles to his elbow and his knee. And he writes about it on the front page of the New York Times. You can't make this stuff up. So I'm about to go to Harvard College. I start reading about Chinese medicine. And therein is the chapter that changed the career path of young David Eisenberg, the the translation of the Bible of Asian medicine, the Yellow Emperor's Canon of Internal Medicine, in the first chapter says two things that have stuck with me. First, prevention is always superior to intervention. And the way you eat, the way you move your body, and the way you control and interact with your thoughts not only impacts your health, but dictates your recuperative capacity. That's the basis of teaching kitchens right there. At my core, I began to wonder, what if we could imagine kitchens in hospitals where someday we could teach people to eat, cook, move, and think more healthfully? Going back to the roots of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, uh, initially your focus was uh, doing this through chefs doing this through a lot of continuing ed through the Culinary Institute. As I entered the medical profession and during my advanced training, I saw this enormous gap, this blind spot in medicine where no doctors ever talked about food. And I thought, this is insane. Everybody eats. Food has a major impact on cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, cancer, and to me, the absence of a teaching kitchen and any effort to talk to patients about nutrition and food in the absence of a kitchen is like trying to advise people about the benefits of swimming in the absence of a swimming pool. So I joined with my colleague, Walter Willett, the chairman of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health, and with the heads of the Culinary Institute of America and said, what if we brought together nutrition scientists and the top chefs to teach health professionals what they need to know about what to eat more of, less of, and why, how to cook it, and how to change their behaviors. That became a conference called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives, which was just given last week for its 19th time and has attracted seven or 8,000 clinicians over the last 20 years. After giving that conference for 10 years to health professionals, I realized now we need to translate that into curricula for the public, for patients, for kids in K through 12 schools, for retirees, for the military. How do we teach people a different relationship with food to get them to not only enjoy healthy, delicious, affordable, easy to make foods, but to crave them in place of the relatively unhealthy and unsustainable foods that are currently in the marketplace. I asked at one of these conferences, if the physicians in the audience were experimenting with kitchens and hospitals, and 100 out of 400 hands went up. So 2015, 16, I invited those that wanted to share what they were doing to come together. And the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative is now a group of nearly 50 organizations, mainly hospitals, medical schools, universities, with teaching kitchens committed to sharing what they're learning and evaluating how teaching kitchen curricula impact regular people, medical students, retirees, patients with diabetes, you name it. So you mentioned earlier about prevention versus treatment. And the approach that you're taking runs counter to what are a lot of traditional <laughs> medical models, which really focus on 
treatment over necessarily prevention as a as a focus. So what do you think needs to change in terms of training, in terms of the modern healthcare model to better take advantage of food and nutrition? I, I think the reckoning is coming because we're reaching 20% of GDP being devoted to healthcare. So we're at 19 cents plus a dot per dollar of every dollar in the United States going to medical care. When we hit 20%, I think the businesses of the country will scream uncle and say, we cannot keep going up by double digit inflation. We can no longer just pay fee for service to any hospital and doctor who says, this is what I did, this is what you owe me. We will have to shift to what's called a capitated system where all the people receiving the money for hospitals, surgeries, drugs will, will be told, we can only go up X percent a year because that's it. Or they'll be told, you're going to share in the risk. So if we can keep people out of the hospital, you make more money. If we can keep people from getting diabetic who are now obese, you get more money. The incentives will have to shift. So last fall, last September, the White House hosted its first health and nutrition summit in 60 years right. and made the concept of food as medicine a strategic priority. So from a systemic standpoint, what opportunities do you think this policy has the potential to unlock and what barriers need to be overcome in order for that to happen? I think in the last six months, a lot of these barriers have just begun to crumble or at least crack. When Representative McGovern passed his resolution, 1118, that says the medical profession has been derelict in its responsibility by not requiring physicians to know much, if at all, about nutrition or how to advise patients about healthful food procurement and better food choices. So to change that, this bipartisan resolution says, either demand that physicians in training and in practice know more about nutrition and how to advise patients about food, or we, the U.S. House of Representatives, reserves the right to withhold $10.3 billion in residency training funds for your residents in all of our hospitals. You decide. A few weeks later, the White House conference occurred. And the discussion was, we're no longer stuck with just food insecurity. We now have a bigger problem of nutritional insecurity. We're not giving Americans nutritional food. A lot of them may be obese, but not well-nourished. Also, the food as medicine topic was brought to the national dialogue. And food as medicine includes more than just medically tailored meals for patients at end of life to show that it saves money by having them not come back to the hospital so quickly after their surgery. I want to think way upstream. How do we teach people to cook, eat, move, think more healthfully? How do we teach our children to avoid becoming overweight or obese in their teens, 20s, and 30s, as is now predicted for more than half of them? That's where I'm focusing. A lot of the audience that will be reading the article in Food Technology, the people that are listening to this podcast are R&D scientists, they're product developers, uh, they work for some of the major food manufacturers in the industry. What role do you see industry potentially playing in this effort? I'm excited by this question because... It's too simplistic and too naive on my part to imagine that everybody in America is going to go back to cooking an hour a day every day. That's not our collective future. On the other hand, I'm not giving up on the notion that everybody should know something about food, where it comes from, how it's processed, and how to make better choices. Getting back to your question, I see the tent as open and massive. How do we use technology to make things better and more sustainable and increase shelf life? How do we harvest foods from the seas, the, the algae and the seaweeds to make spectacular foods and also clean the air we breathe? 
how do we do better in the alternative meats from plants in a way that will hopefully diminish the impact of animals on the environment, but still give great culinary satisfaction that is healthy? And how do we work with people in your industry who share the view that, yes, we can make celebratory foods, snacks, foods rich with fat, salt, sugar, but they are celebratory foods. They're not foods to be eaten every day by every child. How do we spend more time having the portfolio of your industry devoted to healthy, sustainable, delicious foods, better processing, better canning, better freezing, better, you know, ultra cold freezing of sustainable fish that can make them sushi grade. These are all food technologies. So I think my almost absurd vision of having everybody learn a different relationship to food and cooking and health and planetary survival will be enhanced and supercharged by those in your industry that will share the same view and say, let us use technology to deliver that faster, better, and cheaper. That's where we meet. David Eisenberg is an adjunct associate professor and director of culinary nutrition at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the executive director of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. You can read Food Technology's extended interview with him in the March issue and online at ift.org. It's no secret that women have different physiologies than men and different nutritional needs. Food products that claim to benefit women's health are exploding in the marketplace. According to Innova Market Insights, launches of food and beverage products tied to women's health increased 35% from 2017 to 2021. These new products aim to address everything from managing menopause to boosting athletic endurance. Food Technologies' Emily Little sat down with Dr. Linda Alvarez of Level Nutrition to talk about the importance of women's health products and her own entry into the sports nutrition category. Linda, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Emily. I appreciate it. So I think with this category spotlight that we've written, a lot of it just comes down to those physiological differences between men and women. So could you describe what those differences are and how that translates over to nutrition? Sure. So this is a great question. Um, I will want to start out by saying that the research that is available on female athletes, on women's macronutrient metabolism and metabolic needs is limited, but that research is growing, which is really exciting. When we look down to it, women throughout their lives experience changes through their metabolism based on their hormones. So if you look at the research, before puberty, men and women have similar metabolisms. And then with puberty, with the introduction of estrogen really being a big player in women's lives, that changes those metabolic needs. And so we end up seeing changes that happen week to week throughout the menstrual cycle, as well as changes throughout the various stages of women's life cycles. So this can include pregnancy, breastfeeding, perimenopause, and menopause. And so it's really important for us to have so much of a better understanding of not only what those weeks of the menstrual cycle looks like, but also these various phases in women's life, how does metabolism change? And so one of the biggest things that we end up seeing is for women within their menstrual cycle, we really divide it up into two phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The follicular phase is that first half of the menstrual cycle. So we're looking at the first day of the period up until ovulation. And during this time, carbohydrate metabolism is, is really the main source of energy. Um, it's really the main um, carbohydrate oxidation is really the main event that goes on during this time. However, during the luteal phase, which is the second half of the menstrual cycle, and so that's from ovulation up until a period, 
what we see is that there's actually a change from carbohydrate oxidation to fat and protein oxidation, much more so being preferred. So what we'll see is, for example, with estradiol increasing within the luteal phase, that actually muscle glycogen is spared. And so there's a preference to oxidizing free fatty acids, which can have really beneficial and positive impacts in terms of endurance training. And so if women and consumers, as well as the market has a better understanding of what these changes look like throughout the weeks of the menstrual cycle, we're really able to see a much better utilization of the nutrients that are going in, in terms of performance. And going into that performance aspect, your products obviously are sports nutrition. Why is that the area that you chose to focus on? Yeah, so that's a a great question. Something that we found that was really alarming to us um, was that around or actually less than 2.5% of sports nutrition products target women. Um, And I'm doing air quotes when I say target, because there's little clarity of if they're just being directly marketed to women, or if they are actually made with women's nutrition and health in mind. What we were finding was that we had interviewed over 100 athletes prior to starting our company, and there was this resounding theme among female athletes of there were kind of lack of products for women, not only that, but the products that were on the market when they were doing this high intensity endurance workouts, um, they were just having to go through boxes of product to find basically fuel that wasn't making them sick. Um, So these can be a a myriad of physical side effects ranging from headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle cramps, all throughout the course of training and competition. And this is really heightened with our endurance athletes. Um, And so seeing this hole in the market, as well as hearing from so many female athletes that They haven't been felt acknowledged within the space or heard in terms of what product offerings were out there really made us focus within that sports nutrition sector. So zooming back out a bit, Mm -hmm. why do you think it's so important to have these products that are specifically tailored for women's health? Yeah, so I, I think it's specifically important just because women have had to for decades at this point kind of silently go through and suffer many of the negative physical side effects that are associated with products that are on the market within the sports nutrition space it was overwhelming how many women acknowledged and shared with us just how difficult it was to find nutrition products that were able to meet their athletic needs, but also didn't make them physically sick. And that was really alarming to us. It almost became as though it was second nature within sports to just go through boxes of product and suck it up and deal. And hearing that was was really difficult for me as an interviewer. And I think what was most upsetting was that every woman that we spoke to that was having some issues with products on the market felt as though it was her body that was the problem rather than the products that were available. And when you hear that from over 70% of the women that you interview, you can feel confident knowing this isn't a problem with you. This is a problem that we need to tackle and change together. And so along with there being products that that are addressing these concerns for women, there really should as well be research um, that is expanding this field and this level of knowledge putting forward. Yeah, I remember in Spoonshot's latest uh, trend predictions, they had mentioned that women's nutrition studies grew last year, I think it was something like nine times, which is great, but let's keep that momentum going. Linda, thank you so much for joining me and good luck with your product launches. Ah, Thank you so much, Emily. 
Linda Alvarez is the co-founder and CEO of Level, a sports nutrition product startup tailored to female endurance athletes. Read more about the growing women's health category in the March issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT First Annual Event and Expo. This year's event theme is innovation in a time of crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? Go to iftevent.org today. Join us and be part of the solution. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation and in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.